My name is Dan Finucan, and I'm currently a regent. I love folk music, blues music, and I love singing and playing with other people. My name is Ian Peoples. I'm a Jesuit regent. I'm kind of a football fanatic. Most of my weekends are spent watching at least a few games. Um, I'm probably one of the biggest Lino Messi fans. Welcome back to Majus Talk, where we ask the question, where is God calling me to today? I'm your host, Ian Peoples, and I'm joined by my brother Jesuit, Dan Finucan. Today, we will finish our discussion of the Nicene Creed by focusing on the third and last part of the Creed, where we express belief in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. In this part of the Creed, we recite, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. As we mentioned in the first part, in the first episode of the series, The Creed came about as a result of nearly four centuries of reflection and pondering the mystery of who Jesus Christ is and who he revealed God to be. The early church spent a lot of time figuring out who Jesus is. Is he really human? Is he really divine? Is he both human and divine? And they talked about what the nature of Jesus' relationship to God the Father really is. And this is what we discussed in our last episode. But then in the mid-fourth century, the church needed to wrestle with the nature of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is co-equal with God the Father, then what about the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit a creature created by God the Father? Is the Holy Spirit one in being with God the Father and also God the Son? At the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, the bishops gathered and along with reaffirming previous teachings on who Jesus is as the Son of God, They also affirmed that the Holy Spirit is also Lord and proceeds from the Father, not as a created being like human beings or even angels, but as true God, glorified and adored in the same way as God the Father and God the Son. The early church came to these conclusions by reflecting on the scriptures, but also by using reason and philosophy, the reason or the philosophy at the time which helped them articulate their belief in God as being one in being or co-equal and three persons. One could spend a whole lifetime just contemplating the mystery of the Trinity using different terms, different philosophy, different theology. But perhaps the most important thing for us here is to consider that the early church relied not only on what was received from the scriptures and their own reason, but also their experience in the church. The early church experienced the Holy Spirit active and alive in their midst, drawing them towards Christ. They experienced the Holy Spirit as truly the giver of life, as an advocate, as an animator. They came to see that indeed the Spirit had been speaking through the prophets for centuries, gradually pointing the way towards God, revealing God's self completely in Jesus Christ. And it is this same spirit today that draws us as a church community together. Whenever we come to celebrate Eucharist or the sacraments or when we come to pray together, it's the spirit that opens our hearts to hear the word of God and the scriptures and to let that word draw us closer to Christ, who then leads us closer to God the Father. We, like the early church, experience the spirit as alive in our hearts, a divine presence, When we experience the Spirit, we know what it is to truly proclaim that the Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, because we have that very life within us. I often like to think of the Spirit as a free, kind of dancing, joyful presence, kind of like the wind blowing about, who shakes me from when I get a little too stuck in my ways, when prayer feels a little stale, or when I feel a little too satisfied with how life is going. 
I feel like the Holy Spirit shakes me awake and says, Dan, wake up. Go back to Christ. Listen to him. Does he have that same raspy voice? Sometimes. <laughs> it's as if the Spirit is grabbing me by the arm and playfully but firmly guiding me back to the heart of my faith, the person of Jesus. So now we get into kind of murky waters in the history of the church because we're going to talk about what we call the filioque controversy. In the history of the church, there has been disagreement around the line of the creed that reads, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And this disagreement has been between the Roman Catholic Church, Western Christianity, and the Eastern Orthodox churches. They disagree about from whom the Holy Spirit proceeds. That last phrase, and the Son, is the source of the argument. The Roman Catholic Church includes and the Son when we recite the Creed, believing that the Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. The Eastern churches, however, argue that the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. Certainly, there is plenty to say about this argument, and we recommend that if you're interested, you take some time to learn about this controversy. Again, it's often known as the filioque controversy. And that word filioque is the Latin translation, which means, and from the Son of God. We figured that we wanted to give you another word to impress people with at parties, just like we did in our previous episode. That's right. Filioque. There you go. But for our understanding, for our purposes in understanding this controversy, in the 6th century, the church in the West, which at the time would have meant Europe, began to say that the Spirit proceeded from both the Father and the Son whenever they recited the Creed. Well, why the change? Why does it matter? Well, it mattered because certain early church theologians began making the point that the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, were co-equal in their being, meaning they all exist and have always existed together as one. All three, though distinct persons, are one being together. And if that is the case, then they argued the Spirit must proceed from the Father as Jesus says very clearly in the farewell discourse of John's gospel. But if all three persons are co-equal, then the West taught that the Spirit proceeded not just from the Father, but from the Son as well. Some early church theologians like Tertullian and Hilary of Poitiers, household names I'm sure, <laughs> taught that the Spirit came forth from the Father and was sent by the Son. One can look at how Jesus breathes the Spirit on the disciples in the upper room in chapter 20 of John's Gospel to see how those theologians would draw those conclusions. And later on in the 8th century, when there was some dispute about Jesus' divinity and some within the church questioned whether Jesus was merely an adopted Son of God, stating that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son was actually a way of stating that the Son was co-equal with the Father and, as a result, divine. The Eastern Church, however, did not agree with this doctrinal development. And there's a whole history behind why that is. But ultimately, this led to a mutual excommunication between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Church in 1054 AD and that is known as the Great Schism. If you'd like to learn more about the complicated history of how this argument and schism came to be, we recommend a statement put out by a commission of Catholics and Orthodox from 2004 under the bishops of the United States. And we will include the link below. Now, the final part of the creed includes beliefs about the church, as well as baptism, resurrection, and eternal life. These things are included under the Holy Spirit because it is the Spirit that animates the church and draws it together in love as the body of Christ. It's the Spirit that draws the church together as one, as holy, as Catholic or universal, which is what Catholic means, and as apostolic, meaning being founded upon the apostles. The Spirit is like extended arms, reaching into our lives and drawing us into Christ and Christ's body on earth, the church. So the next line in the creed is, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. One holy Catholic and apostolic are traditionally referred to as the four marks of the church. 
One could think of them as the four principles through which the Holy Spirit draws the church together in its identity as the body of Christ, proclaiming the gospel in the world. I had a teacher a while ago who explained that the four marks of the church are both a gift of the Spirit and a task of the Spirit. What he meant by that is that because the Holy Spirit draws the church together as the body of Christ, it will always have these four marks, these four principles. The church will be in a very real way, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And this is a gift that the church receives from the Spirit and participates in. But these four marks are also a task for the church. There's something that we need to work on. And we can consider our own experience of the church to see how that's true. There are multiple different Christian churches and denominations. And you can see that here in Belize, you can see it elsewhere in the world. And that seems, and it does, fly in the face of our unity as a church. We also know of scandals in the church or of the ways that we as individuals and communities don't live up to our call to holiness. There are times when the beauty of our diversity has been put aside and we aren't as Catholic or universal as we are called to be. And there seem to always be challenges to the apostolic faith and to understanding it, to articulating it, and there can be a lot of confusion out there about what it is that we believe. As a church, then, we ask for light from the Holy Spirit to more and more live up to the call and the gift of being one holy Catholic and apostolic. So let's take each of the marks and look at them one by one. One, in his farewell discourse in John's Gospel, Jesus offers a prayer that echoes down through the centuries as an invitation and challenge to the church. He says, I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me, and that you loved them even as you loved me. One of the great scandals that many people who are not Christian point out to those of us who are Christian is that we appear so divided. There are so many different denominations, different churches, and we argue and fight a lot. Just look around Belize and you will probably hear these arguments going on here. And it's important to remember that Christ's message of love and of drawing all to himself ought to call us back to pray for, and work for greater unity so that Jesus' prayer that we just heard will come to fruition. And yet, despite many of the differences that exist between the various denominations and churches, we do believe that at some fundamental level, those who profess Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior to the glory of God the Father and the Holy Spirit do participate in some form of unity. There is much that we share in our faith as Christians. And we should consider the ways in which we can make our unity more visible, more tangible. This is a task for which we need God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy. I often hear people say that one of the reasons that they don't go to church is because there are so many darned hypocrites there. Or, to put it more bluntly, there are so many sinners in the church. And to that, I would simply say, yep, you're right, we gather together as sinners. But it's important to note that there's something else about us. We're sinners called to serve God by letting God's mercy embrace us and change our hearts. We come to God to worship together as church, not because we're perfect, but because we desire God's help to grow in holiness and in perfection. When Jesus says, be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect, we know that's a high bar. We know that we will not reach that perfection in this lifetime in any sustained way. But we still seek God's help in the Spirit to try. And when we do that, we say yes to the universal call to holiness that each of us has been given by virtue of our baptism. This universal call was articulated in a fresh and new way at the Second Vatican Council 
and has been promoted a lot since, especially by Pope St. John Paul II and Pope Francis. So yes, we are sinners, but we are sinners who are loved and redeemed by God, sent out into the world to love, to promote the justice of the kingdom of God. And when we do this, we discover the holiness of God and how that holiness is shining forth from within and in our community. Next, Catholic. If you have ever looked at the printout of the creed, you'll notice that the word Catholic is not capitalized. This might seem strange or might come as a surprise because as Catholics with a capital C, we might think that Catholic refers to the church's title. But other Christians who are not Roman Catholic also recite the Nicene Creed and profess belief in a church that is lowercase c Catholic. So what does it mean to say that the church is Catholic? That word comes from the Greek word katholikos, another word to impress people at the dinner table. And that word means universal, or a better way of putting it, all-embracing. Christianity begins in a particular place during a particular time period in what is now Palestine about 2,000 years ago. Initially, it was Jewish men and women who were Christians. But within 15 or so years of Jesus' death and resurrection, the question of what to do about non-Jews became the source of controversy and occasioned the need for the Council of Jerusalem. At this council, it was determined that followers of Christ did not need to first become Jews in order to become Christians. In this way, then, faith in Christ was not dependent on being part of a particular ethnic group or speaking a particular language. In the Pentecost story, where the apostles preach and are heard by different groups of people in different languages, drives that point home even further. Christian faith is lowercase Catholic in the sense that it embraces all cultures and languages in their uniqueness. Each culture is like a piece of colored glass in a stained glass window. When the light of Christian faith passes through, it illuminates the best of that culture, while that culture helps draw out a little more of the fullness of the faith. And together, these different cultures combine to make an ever-enlargening, beautiful stained glass window, which is the beautiful diversity of the church. It's important to note, however, that Catholicity always is held together with the church being one. So, yes, the church is full of diversity, but at the end of the day, our belief in Christ and his teaching as it comes to us through scripture and tradition is held together in a unity. For example, if there was a church in some part of the world, some local church that professed God as four persons that are co-equal, we'd have a huge problem. So it's important then to remember that it's the Holy Spirit who draws together the various corners of the church into a diverse unity. We are many parts, but ultimately we are one body in Christ. And as a result, it's important to remember a couple of things. One is that unity is not uniformity. Believing that the church is Catholic means we will not all worship in the same language. Our music may sound different, some communities may have liturgical dance to express their love of God, while others may not. Christ may be imaged as having a lighter complexion in Europe, but a darker complexion in Africa or Latin America. But the key is that we remain followers of Christ and that we come together for Eucharist to receive the body of Christ. Which leads us to the second point, Catholicity, or being all-embracing. And that doesn't mean do whatever you want. Part of the beauty of our church is that we are drawn together in the Spirit, and we ought to constantly be discerning about how we express our faith. At the end of the day, the Nicene Creed is one way among many that we come together to profess the same faith. We may express it differently, but the core of our faith must remain rooted in who God has been revealed to be in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. If a community strays from this in their worship or in their theology, then there's a time and a place for the church to work with that community in charity to find their way to communion with the rest of the church. Of course, we want clear lines about what this looks like, this Catholicity, this oneness. But as we've gotten a taste of from discussing the creed these last few episodes, it can take the church a long time, sometimes centuries, to work out controversies. 
So the key is to continuously return to the Holy Spirit in humility for guidance, in prayer, in study, and trust that the Spirit is guiding us as a church to the truth. And it may be messy along the way, but that has often been the case in the church's history of understanding the fullness of our faith. And that leads us to the final mark of the church. Apostolic. To say that the church is apostolic is to say a couple of really important things. First and foremost, it means to say that the faith we have and share as a church is the richness of the faith that has been passed down through the centuries, not just by being taught, but by being lived out in the concrete lives of Christians in the church. We believe that the Holy Spirit has led the church in continuing to proclaim the faith that the apostles themselves received and handed on to the church, and these apostles received it from Christ 2,000 years ago. One of the beautiful things about this apostolic faith is that far from the faith growing stale over the centuries, we have only come to understand it more and more deeply. The apostolic tradition includes the scriptures as well as the traditions that have been passed down, how we worship, beliefs about the significance of the Blessed Virgin Mary for our faith, and so on. I like to think of the apostolic nature of the church as like a a flower that's continuing to grow, a flower that was initially a seedling. When that seed was received, everything was packed into it at the very beginning of the church, and I mean everything. But this doesn't mean that Peter and the apostles had everything figured out right at the beginning, far from it. As we mentioned in our first episode on the Creed, the Creed is the result of nearly 400 years of prayer, reflection, debate, and experience in the church of figuring out who Christ is as fully human and fully divine. And as Karl Rahner, a famous theologian of the 20th century wrote, even when we were able to name Christ, as fully human and fully divine, this wasn't the end of developing our understanding, but really the beginning of deepening our understanding. Because for each of us, we profess our belief and then we grow in understanding of who Christ is in our lives, who Christ is in our communities. And this all makes sense that our understanding of the apostolic faith unfolds over time. Jesus promises in the farewell discourse of John's gospel where he sends the Holy Spirit, the advocate, to guide us to all truth. Again, we believe the church is apostolic, not because we human beings have always been faithful to the apostolic faith, but because the Holy Spirit has preserved the church as a community as never erring from the apostolic faith. And the final point about the church being apostolic is that we believe the Spirit has maintained a succession of leaders within the church to teach and to help guide the church in the apostolic faith. And we believe that these leaders have their succession all the way back to the apostles. We also, we most often think of bishops when we think of apostolic succession. And this is the the primary form of apostolic succession. But it's important to remember that all of the baptized share in this succession as well. Think of how important it is for parents to teach the faith to, to their children. The bishops have a unique role and an incredibly important role as direct successors of the apostles to guide their flock as pastors, to teach the faith with charity and with the Pope as their head to ultimately help keep the church from error. Again, all this being done in charity, in love. And this leads us to the final sentence of the creed. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. There's something fitting about how the creed ends. This final sentence starts with the beginning of our lives as Christians in baptism and moves us toward our hope in the resurrection of the dead, our hope that God is bringing about a new heaven and a new earth. We started the creed with an expression of who God is as father and maker of all things. God is the source of everything and ourselves. And here at the end of the creed, we finish with our hope of a final return to God through being raised with Christ after we die to eternal life in the world that is to come. This movement of our lives is one in which the entire way, Christ accompanies us in the spirit, leading us back to God the Father. The creed is all about our belief in a triune God, 
but not a triune God who's distant or absent from creation. Our creed expresses belief in a God who enters into our reality in order to lead us into the fullness of God's reality. We confess one baptism, which truly is for the forgiveness of sins. As Catholics, we believe that sin entered the world in a damaging way, and that's endured and affected the world from long ago. Traditionally, this sin is seen as rooted in the sin of Adam and Eve, and we refer to the effects of sin that we are born into as original sin. In baptism, we believe that original sin is wiped away. We believe that Christ has died and risen, and that by doing so, he's destroyed this endless chain of sin and has redeemed us so that we might live in love, peace, and justice with one another and with God. By being baptized, as St. Paul writes in, the Roman, in his letter to the Romans, we die with Christ so that we might rise with him to new life. And he continues in Romans by saying, We know that Christ, raised from dead, the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. As to death, he died to sin once and for all. As to his life, he lives for God. Consequently, you too must think of yourselves as being dead to sin and living for God in Christ Jesus. Of course, we still remain tempted to sin and give in to sin in our lives from time to time. And that's why we have the gift of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which draws us again into the living God in Christ Jesus. We receive the mercy Christ came to give us, and, and through Jesus we receive that forgiveness of God. Finally, the Creed speaks of a belief in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We believe as Christians that by being raised from the dead to eternal life, Jesus is the first fruits of what God desires and will do for us. By raising Jesus from the dead, God declares without any question about it that death no longer has any power over us. It is for this reason that we often say of ourselves that we are an Easter people. As we said above, we believe that if we die with Christ, we die to all of the ways that death holds power over us. And this doesn't mean that we won't die physically, but it does mean that we will rise with Christ in the world that is to come. It does mean that any suffering we endure in our lives cannot be the only meaning of our lives, and that even that suffering can have meaning. It can point towards life. And it also means that our sins, however grave they might be, or might have been, are ultimately swallowed up in God's mercy if only we say yes to God's offer of mercy in Jesus Christ. So we'll take a deep Ooh. breath. We made it through the creed. The whole thing. The whole thing. We, did, we didn't do an abridged version. <laughs> we didn't take out certain parts. We did it all. It was all of it. Yeah, but here's the deal. We have just scratched the surface of the creed. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's a lot more than we could get, even hope to get through on our show. Mm-hmm. And so we encourage you to learn more. Throughout the other two episodes, we gave some great resources for you to look at, looking at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the book by Bishop Barron, which is again called Light from Light. So we recommend those resources as ways of learning more about the creed and learning more about our faith. And, of course, we always end our show with a question. So, our question for today, what is one aspect or part of the Catholic Church that you find most inspiring or most interesting? I think I really look back to the, how you ended our discussion of the Creed talking about mercy. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the, the, the most powerful uh, message of our faith is that we have we are always offered mercy in Jesus, right? Um, Pope Francis says that you know God never tires of forgiving us. It's we who get tired of asking for that forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And I think that's there's a, a, a relentless mercy that God offers us. and uh, and it's so important because I think so many people are racked by the mistakes that they've made or that, you know, the ways in which they've hurt others, um, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally. And I know I've experienced that in my life. I know I've hurt people and I've questioned, man, can, can God forgive me? You know, mm-hmm. 
And so receiving this, this, this mercy and knowing that, that nothing can keep us from the love of God, I think that helps me proclaim that in the work that I do, especially at the prison. Yeah. Almost every week, almost every day, I get asked the question, can God forgive all sins? You know, And I get to tell guys yes. And so I think the, the mercy that we have in our faith, the forgiveness of sins that Jesus re- really gives us is the most powerful message that we have. And I think it's, it's something that everyone needs to hear. So back at you. What's what part of our aspect of our faith you, do you find inspiring or interesting? Yeah, I I would have to say I I love the idea of sacramentality, hmm. and I think it it um, it's one of the great gifts specifically of the Catholic Church because I think it's an insight into something that is kind of radical that God does, which um, which we talked about in our last episode. This idea of of um, you know, God doesn't remain removed from from our lives or, or from God's creation, but really dives in through Jesus in the mm-hmm. incarnation. And the fact that I think there's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's divine genius. Um, but there's something just so powerful about the idea that God's grace operates through stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. My dad likes to talk about stuff as a theological word. Um, <laughs> but that ordinary things, bread, wine, um, you know, oil, um, the laying on of hands, um, that, that these things can be a way in which God communicates with us mm-hmm. and God draws close to us. And yet we still maintain that God is creator mm-hmm. and isn't just to be found there, but, but you know, it, it defies the ability to, to describe it. But um, to me, I think it's something that, that really, if we take it seriously, revolutionizes how we consider the world. Mm-hmm. You know, as, as the poet, uh, Gerard Maley Hopkins, the Jesuit poet, says, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And I think you can only say that if you think of the world as a sacrament, mm-hmm. as being a visible sign of God's immediate and invisible grace being right there. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think sacramentality, I think it's just a, a great gift. Yeah, and, and we like to, you know, to talk about finding God in all things and Ignatian spirituality. And, and we talk about, you know, the, we even use our five senses in prayer, right? We even imagine using the five senses in prayer because we believe that everything that we have is a gift from God and that we're supposed to use everything to draw. God wants to use everything to draw us back to himself. And so that includes especially our senses because we are body and soul, right? Um, well, yeah, and, and going back to what you were saying about mercy, I think that's why the crucifix is so important for us mm-hmm. to actually see the body uh, of Jesus because it, that, that is a sacrament of mercy, mm-hmm. you know, um, mm-hmm. the sacrament of, of, of humanity being lived out in its poverty, as, as Met said in our, as you quoted in our last episode. Mm-hmm. So it, it really, uh, there's something about that that I think is really important to, to touch. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah. mercy is something that is tangible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we hope that you also have things that inspire you or encourage you in our faith. And if you do, write those in the comments on Facebook or on YouTube. If you're watching us on Guadalupe Media's television channel, thank you for joining us. If you're on the radio, well, drive safe. And if you're, if you're driving, I guess. And uh, we look forward to being with you again next time. God bless you all.